Dr. Teller, can I talk to you? A woman in a warm flannel robe draped over her nightshirt peeked into the ward. Selma Teller tore herself away from another medical history. Yes, Mrs. Laura Randall. Selma, my blood pressure is high, sighed Laura. Could you give me a pill? All right, ask the girls at the station, okay? Selma smiled. They'll give you what you need. But they won't, Laura shrugged. I asked. They refused. Can you sort this out? Selma nodded in response. Fine, go to your room. I'll bring you the pills. Thank you, doctor. I'm counting on you. I'll be waiting for you. The pressure is bothering me and the weather today is terrible. Selma understood. The woman just wanted to talk. Nothing to be done about it. Many elderly patients lack companionship, so they try to compensate for this need during their hospital stays. Yes, the weather is truly awful. Selma glanced out the window. It was drizzling, and she had left her umbrella at home. Hopefully, the rain would stop before her shift ended. Only an hour left. Lord, she was tired. But it's okay. Three days off were ahead. And Robin would be back. How she missed him. Well then, I'll be waiting for you, dear said Laura. Try to get the medication. This pressure is worrying me. Selma promised to get the tablet the best one. The patient smiled even wider and disappeared behind the door. Selma finished filling out the medical history, leaned back on the uncomfortable chair, and closed her eyes. She wanted to sleep terribly. The night was restless, busy, nothing serious, luckily, just the usual troubles. Someone's stomach hurts, someone's blood pressure, or just a patient can't sleep before surgery and decides to chat with the doctor. Nothing. Just have to get through the meeting and then go home. Wait for Robin. Selma went to the station. Nurse Teresa convinced her that Laura Randall's blood pressure was fine and she definitely didn't need any pills. I measured her blood pressure three times, Teresa protested, and she doesn't believe it. Says hers is higher than the tonometer shows. She feels it. She's getting on my nerves. Selma pulled the tonometer out of the cabinet standing at the station. Teresa, get some vitamin B. I'll give it to her and say it's for nerves. And I don't lie, she always gets her blood pressure back to normal with vitamins. Ah, placebo effect? Teresa chuckled, handing Selma the vitamins. I admire your patience. Why admire? Selma said. It's easier to negotiate with the patient than to argue. Fifteen minutes later, Laura Randall's blood pressure returned to normal. At least, Laura herself believed so. And Selma endured the meeting, trying not to yawn and keep her eyes open. It wasn't easy for her. She felt like she was about to fall off her chair. She needed to drink some awful coffee from the vending machine. The taste was disgusting, but at least she would get a dose of caffeine. Finally, Selma was allowed to go home. She quickly changed clothes, said goodbye to her colleagues, and rushed off. Robin would be back the day after tomorrow so she needed to get some rest and then run to the store. There was nothing in the fridge. When Robin was away on business, Selma always felt lazy to cook and would just eat sandwiches or frozen pizza, but she believed in pampering her husband. That's why she always cooked homemade meals for him. Robin highly appreciated her culinary skills and always said how lucky he was to have her. Although Selma herself was sure he wasn't that lucky, but she, on the other hand, felt like she had hit the jackpot she was just ordinary, not particularly beautiful, slim, with no appealing curves. Selma was short, with a pale face and unremarkable features. Well, with makeup, Selma learned to accentuate those features, and she did quite well. But where would she wear makeup? Only to work. She didn't have the time or energy for it. Her hair was the only lucky part, long, thick, light brown, slightly wavy. At work, she wore it up in a bun, but at home, she let it down and Robin always complimented her, calling her his mermaid. Selma melted at his words. Mermaid, come on! They met a year ago. Selma had already given up hope of meeting the right man. By that time, she was 30, and she believed that at that age, her chances were practically nil. How many young and beautiful girls were around? Thousands. But Selma didn't want to marry the first guy she met. She sincerely couldn't understand women who only needed a man in the house, and she decided for herself that she would either find the right one or remain alone. However, Selma didn't mind being alone. She loved her job, and solitude didn't bother her. 
On the contrary, she enjoyed having so much free time. She could read, learn, attend seminars, or simply stroll through the city, sipping coffee and eating ice cream while admiring the well-dressed passers-by. But she still wanted love. She didn't even know what it was exactly, and she didn't have any examples in front of her. Selma didn't know her father. Her mother raised her alone. In school, she was hopelessly in love with a young physics teacher who naturally paid no attention to her. Then Selma enrolled in medical school. She had no free time there at all. Selma was either studying another chapter from a textbook, doing practical work at the hospital, or preparing for exams. Later, she got a job where she sometimes had to work for two days straight. Selma spent her weekends sleeping, helping her mother, and improving her own qualifications. After all, there was so much new information available. There were seminars and articles in scientific journals, so Selma simply didn't have the opportunity to look for a boyfriend. Besides, all the male doctors at the hospital where she worked were already married. One admittedly tried to court her, but Selma firmly rejected him. Being someone's mistress wasn't for her, but last year completely changed everything in her life. First, her mother died simply from a heart attack. She went to the store, collapsed. Bystanders called an ambulance, but the doctors didn't make it in time. They pronounced her dead upon arrival. Selma spent several months in depression. She wasn't close to her mother. She preferred strictness in upbringing. In her childhood, Selma never fully understood why her mother was always so cold to her. But then she realized she was just taking out her resentment towards her father on her. Selma knew practically nothing about her father. Her mother avoided talking about him, and there wasn't a single photo of him at home. Selma only knew that her father ran away when he found out her mother was pregnant. He stopped calling three days before the wedding. Her mother was four months pregnant, and it was too late for an abortion. Her parents turned away from her, and the woman had to move to another city to avoid gossip. There she found work as a seamstress, lived with Selma in a small apartment, managed everything on her own withered prematurely, and became bitter towards the world for being so unfair to her. However, life gradually improved. Her mother bought a larger apartment where Selma now lived, but she never forgot her resentment. She called Selma's father a scoundrel and a traitor, and she often reproached Selma for being like her father. But still, Selma loved her mother and considered her the only family she had. After her mother's death, only work saved her. In the hospital, Selma managed to distract herself from the heavy emotions and the longing for her mother. Sorting through the apartment, she found a photo in her mother's notebook. It depicted her young mother, embracing a tall guy with curly hair. Both were smiling at the photographer, happy and carefree. Selma's heart skipped a beat. She really did look terribly like her father. He was unmistakable. The same facial features, the same smile. Only in figure, she took after her mother, equally petite and slender. Selma hung the photo on the wall above her desk. She liked looking at it and imagining how everything could have been if her dad had stayed with them. They would have had a great family, and her mother would have smiled just as brightly and warmly. Selma had never seen such a smile on her mother's face. What made her dad run away? Fear of responsibility? Another woman? Selma regretted deeply that she would never know though perhaps she could still find her father and talk to him, but she had no time for searches, nor did she have a real desire to do it. What if she got disappointed? What if he looked at her as a stranger, speaking empty phrases, giving one-word answers? No. She'd rather let him remain as the smiling guy embracing her young, beautiful mom around her slender waist. Three months after her mother's death, another event happened that turned Selma's life upside down. One morning, she was awakened by a phone call from an unfamiliar number. Selma Teller? asked a male voice. Yes, it's me. Selma sat up in bed and closed her eyes. The sun was shining through the undrawn curtains, giving the room a distinctly springtime feel. She had become accustomed to such calls. Perhaps it was a relative of another patient. I'm listening, she said. Selma, I don't know where to start, but we need to talk, said the man on the other end. Yes, I'm listening, Selma repeated. The man cleared his throat. Well, you see, I would like to talk to you in person. Could you come over? I would be glad to come, but it's not possible. 
I'm sorry, who am I speaking with? She asked. The man remained silent. Selma started to feel uneasy. Could it be a phone scam? My name is Hector Egerton, the man said after a pause. The name seemed familiar to Selma. Suddenly it clicked. Fourth year. Epidemiology textbook. Authored by Egerton H. How many sleepless nights had she spent poring over its pages? It couldn't be. It was just a coincidence. The textbook had been reprinted many times, studied by generations of doctors. Selma somehow believed that the author had long passed away. Excuse me, are you an epidemiologist? She asked uncertainly. Well, yes, the man chuckled. That's right, and I really need to talk to you. Why? The girl asked, feeling flustered. Trust me, it's very important. Hector sighed. I would like to tell you something in person. I'll dictate the address to you. I hope you can come. I can't come if I don't know why, Selma objected. Please understand me correctly. I doubt you're interested in collaborating on scientific research. You're a world-renowned scientist. I'm just a regular therapist. Selma, I think... I think I might be your grandfather, Hector said. Just come. If you're afraid you can bring someone with you, I must see you. Selma froze. No, this must be some kind of prank. But Hector continued. I recently found out about your existence, and I really want to meet you. I understand that you must be upset, that this news is very unexpected, but I had to take the risk, Selma. I'm ready to write down the address, she replied quietly. Great, he said. Let me dictate it to you. Two days later, Selma saw her grandfather's house for the first time. She found it easily. He had described it to her in detail. An old mansion where Hector occupied half a floor. Seeing the house, Selma was speechless. The moldings, tall windows, balconies with balustrades. Well, nothing surprising. Hector Egerton, a world-renowned scientist, Selma knew that his works were published worldwide and generations of students studied from his textbooks. But she didn't expect such luxury. Selma climbed to the second floor and pressed the doorbell hesitantly. For some reason, she began to tremble. What if she was just being deceived? Hector Egerton couldn't be her grandfather. It must be some mistake. After a minute, the door opened. Selma saw a young woman, bright and well-groomed, with black hair braided. Selma? The woman smiled. Hector is waiting for you. And you? I'm Catherine, the housekeeper and household assistant. She nodded. Come in. Catherine led Selma to Hector's study. He was sitting at the desk, writing something in a notebook. Selma thought he looked very handsome despite his advanced age, with a distinguished gray hair, thin framed glasses, a face lined with wrinkles, a clear gaze, a true scholar just like in the movies. He lacked only a white lab coat thrown over his shoulders. Seeing Selma, he put down his fountain pen and froze a... Hello? Selma chirped, her voice unexpectedly breaking. Goodness, Selma, how alike you are. Ah. Selma was surprised that he didn't stand up when she entered the room. But she quickly understood the reason. The man was sitting in a wheelchair. She approached the desk hesitantly. He didn't take his eyes off Selma. She sat on the edge of the chair. For some reason, she felt ashamed of her appearance. In this office, cluttered with bookshelves and antique furniture, she felt like an alien in her jeans and cheap t-shirt. She could have dressed more decently. After all, even if Hector wasn't her grandfather, he was a renowned scientist. She could have worn a dress, heels, something more elegant. Selma, I can't believe it. Hector shook his head. You remind me so much of Bobby, my god, Selma. His eyes sparkled. She felt scared. Why do you think I'm your granddaughter? Hector paused for a moment, still keeping his remarkably clear gaze on her despite his age. He had just turned 85. It's a very long story, he said finally. Absolutely remarkable. Such resemblance. No need for any expertise. And you chose a profession as a doctor. That's what genes do. We have a medical dynasty, Selma. And you've continued it. Well, I didn't really choose. I used to treat my toys as a child then started bringing home sick dogs and cats. Mom scolded me, but I still brought them home and took care of them. Selma laughed. Hector smiled. The call of blood. Bobby was also studying to be a doctor. 
I hoped so much that he would continue our legacy, but it didn't work out. My dad was studying to be a doctor. What happened to him? Where is he? She asked, startled. The man lowered his gaze. It's a long, a very long story. But I'm ready to listen. Selma leaned forward. Mom never said anything about my dad. I only know that he left her when he found out she was pregnant. Selma, things weren't like that. Or, well, not exactly. Hector picked up a pen from the table and started twirling it between his long fingers. Ah, it's a pity we can't turn back time. I would correct everything. It would all be different. Believe me. Hector was born into a family of doctors. His father was an infectious disease specialist, his mother a general practitioner. Naturally, from childhood, he knew he would also become a doctor, just like his dad. He effortlessly entered medical school, quickly becoming the top student in his class. After finishing his studies, Hector traveled the world as part of scientific expeditions, battling diseases like the plague, cholera, smallpox, and malaria. He was passionately in love with medicine, so passionate that he had no energy left for romantic feelings towards woman. At the age of 30, he managed to defend his doctoral dissertation, becoming the youngest doctor of sciences in his department. Hector met his love at the age of 33. She was 13 years younger, a young laboratory assistant named Janet. She captured his heart with her kind character and angelic appearance. She truly resembled an angel. With her light curls, huge blue eyes, and a long slender neck that Hector particularly liked, he fell in love, once and for all. Despite Janet having only finished high school, Hector enjoyed talking to her about everything under the sun, such as music, nature, and books. People laughed at Hector, a doctor of science, yet he chose a simple girl from the village as his bride. But he didn't care. He knew for sure that he wouldn't love anyone but Janet. He needed only here, and no one else. They got married. The wedding was modest as Janet wanted it to be, just the two of them and their parents. After the wedding, Janet quit her job. They moved into the mansion, the apartment that Hector's father bought. Hector's parents moved to a country house. Both were retired and wanted to enjoy peace and solitude. Janet took care of the house, cooked dinners and lunches for her husband, ironed his robes and shirts. She was ready to devote herself entirely to her husband. Janet admired Hector, even felt a little shy, which amused him and made him love his young wife even more. But Janet couldn't get pregnant. Several years passed since their wedding and they still had no children. Janet fell into despair. She was sure she would never be able to give her husband heirs. She cried, repeating that the dynasty would end because of her. Hector didn't show concern, but sometimes he also thought that maybe they should adopt a child. Of course, he didn't like that idea. His father always said that the Egerton dynasty of doctors should not be interrupted. Your great-great-grandfather was a healer, your grandfather a doctor, and your children and grandchildren will also be doctors. Hector's father often repeated, Remember that, son. Instill these thoughts and ideals into your children. But there was no one to instill ideals into. Janet went to doctors, visited healers, drank herbal remedies, and even started special yoga according to a book. But nothing helped. Hector understood that maybe they wouldn't have children. One day, returning from work, he noticed a church. Hector didn't believe in God. He was a true scientist. But for some reason, he desperately wanted to go into that church. Laughing at his silly, strange desire, Hector went to the church gates. He stood in front of the church for a long time, not knowing how to enter, wondering if he should cross himself. And suddenly someone touched his shoulder. Hector turned around. There stood a thin old man, in a white and crumpled shirt and striped pants. What are you afraid of? he asked. Yes, I'm afraid, Hector admitted. I've never been to church, only as a child my grandmother took me. Well, don't be afraid. What's to fear from God? Come, I'll show you everything. Hector nodded uncertainly. The church smelled of incense. Hector walked among the icons, gazing at the faces of the saints. One icon caught his attention in particular. It depicted an old man with a snowy beard and wise astern eyes. Hector stopped in front of the icon, staring at the old man's face. Suddenly, it seemed to him that the saint was looking straight into his soul. 
a new acquaintance approached Hector and said, You need to pray. Ask for what you want and he will grant it. Just ask from a pure heart. Hector nodded slowly. What if... I ask for a child? He silently pleaded. I promise to be a good father, to give him only the best. Let my wife experience the joy of motherhood. So Hector stood there for about 15 minutes, simply looking at the icon and repeating his request. Then suddenly, he snapped out of it. Oh God, what am I doing? He muttered. I've completely lost my mind. He felt uncomfortable. What if someone saw him? He was a scientist, a doctor of science, a professor, and here he was praying in a church. Hector shook his head and headed for the exit. Outside the fence, he stopped. The fresh air cleared his head. He really had gone crazy, dreaming too much about a son. That's why he got confused. He took out a pack of cigarettes from his pocket and nervously lit one. Name your son Bobby, said the old man in the white shirt, appearing next to him. He smiled at Hector. You understand? What? Hector exclaimed, taken aback. Name your son Bobby, the old man winked, and don't sin for everything is seen from above. Hector nodded bewilderedly and walked to the bus stop. Where did he know what I prayed for? How? Probably I accidentally muttered request out loud while standing in front of the icon, and the old man overheard. That's the only explanation. And why did he say not to sin? Hector's sin was serious. For the past six months, he had been cheating on Janet with his graduate student, the beauty Sophie. He hated himself for it, but he couldn't help it. Janet had completely lost her mind over their childlessness. All she talked about was new infertility treatments. Recently, she started going to some needles, to a miracle doctor whom Hector sincerely considered a charlatan. And then there was Sophie. It was easy and good with her occasionally in bed, more often discussing science. She was so lively, cheerful. Maybe he really should break up with Sophie. Janet would find out eventually, would want a divorce and Hector didn't want to divorce his wife. He knew he only loved her, and you couldn't explain to Janet that Sophie was just a distraction from his worries. Janet wouldn't forgive infidelity for anything. The day after going to church, Hector suggested to Sophie to end their secret meetings. Surprisingly, she took the news rather easily. Okay, she shrugged. I wanted to myself. Victor from the microbiology department has been courting me. Maybe I'll marry him. Two months later, it turned out that Janet, Hector's wife, was pregnant. The man was over the moon with happiness. He carried his wife on his hands, fulfilled any of her whims. From the first months, Janet started wearing maternity clothes, spacious dresses with a high waist. She didn't have a belly yet, but she wanted everyone to know she was expecting a baby. Hector found it touching and amusing. He felt like he loved Janet more than ever. In Dewey Corsi, a boy named Bobby was born. Hector didn't tell his wife why he chose this name. She didn't object. And she didn't have the habit of objecting. After giving birth, his wife changed, dedicating herself entirely to the baby, not leaving him for a moment. Cleaning, cooking, and laundry were now Hector's responsibilities. Bobby grew up as a sickly child, often not sleeping at night and throwing many tantrums. Janet became irritable, lost her sparkle, gained extra weight, especially noticeable given her small stature. Hector hoped that sooner or later this would pass and everything would return to how it was. One evening at the university, he accidentally ran into Sophie. She had already gotten married and was now living with her husband. Sophie suddenly invited him to a cafe. Hector agreed. He didn't want to go back home now, which he was ashamed to admit even to himself. At first they talked about science, discussed university gossip, then they moved on to personal matters. You've changed, Hector, Sophie noticed. I... I'm just tired. He waved it off. The baby doesn't sleep. Janet is completely different now. Changed. Became alien. And I missed you, Sophie suddenly confessed. My husband is good, but too right. Listen, he's on a business trip now. Don't you want to come over? Hector understood everything. He wanted to refuse, but he couldn't. Sophie looked beautiful. Huge brown eyes, thick dark hair, crimson lips. A complete opposite of Janet, 
who had become a pale shadow of herself over the past year. That evening, they ended up in bed again. Hector hated himself, but he couldn't stop. Sophie was passionate and demanding, and he just wanted to dissolve in her completely, forget at least for a while. Then they lay, embracing. Sophie ran her fingers over his chest while he breathed in the scent of her hair. Listen, let's do this again sometime, she asked. But it's wrong, Hector said softly. We can't. Why? She sat up and looked him straight in the eyes. We like each other, and sometimes you need a break from family. You know, I recently read in a magazine that infidelity strengthens a marriage. Variety is necessary. Hector didn't answer. How much he wanted to stay with Sophie. Stay forever. He loved his son, loved his wife, but something had changed recently. Hector no longer felt happy with them. He didn't meet Sophie again after that, and then Janet fell ill. She started losing consciousness, slept a lot, became aggressive and irritable. Hector attributed all this to fatigue and hormones. But after another fainting spell, Janet didn't come too. Hector called an ambulance. They took her to the hospital. The diagnosis was dreadful. Brain tumor. No treatment. Pain relief. Rest. And vitamins. Hector understood perfectly well what this meant. Soon, he would be a widower. The man obediently followed the doctor's recommendations. He was gentle and patient with his wife, feeding her spoon by spoon and carrying her in his arms. Literally this time, Janet couldn't walk anymore. When Bobby turned one, Janet passed away. Hector was left alone with his little son in his arms. He almost perished then. He started drinking, gave up on science, skipped his own lectures at the Institute. He blamed himself for his wife's death, thinking it was punishment for his infidelity, for not paying enough attention to Janet, for not appreciating her enough. Hector's mother came from the village. She had to take care of Bobby. A year later, Hector pulled himself together. To everyone's surprise, he started going to church. He quit drinking once and for all. The man decided that he needed to dedicate himself to his son. Bobby grew up. Hector worked a lot. Sometimes he had romances, but he never got married again. He just didn't want to bring anyone into the house. Bobby was a trouble-free, obedient boy. He excelled in his studies, learned languages, and attended music school. Hector was proud of his son, adored him. He dreamed that Bobby would enter medical school and become a doctor, just like his father. Bobby fulfilled his father's wish. After finishing school, he applied to medical university and was accepted, passing all the exams with top marks. During his fourth year, Bobby went with a friend to a neighboring city for winter break. And when he returned from there, Bobby seemed different. He would become pensive at times, then excessively excited. He started humming songs to himself, laughing loudly for no reason. This worried Hector. It was as if his son, his Bobby, had been replaced. And then he accidentally overheard his conversation on the phone. Yes, darling, of course I'll come, soon. And Hector understood. Bobby was in love. His first thought was that he just hoped it wouldn't affect his studies. But Hector got angry at himself. Can one only think about that? His son was young and handsome. It was the perfect time for romances. But the father's worry still remained. And Hector decided to have a talk with his son. Bobby confessed everything. Yeah, Dad, I met a girl. What kind of girl? Hector asked. Is she nice? The best, Bobby said. Beautiful and kind. Smart. True, she lives quite far away, but it's okay. We'll figure something out. For now, I'll visit her during breaks and then... Then we'll get married. Well, you could introduce me to her, Hector grumbled. Are you embarrassed of your old man, huh? Bobby's cheeks flushed. Oh no, not at all. It's just too early. Maybe she's just shy. She's... Well, she's just an ordinary seamstress and you're a professor, Bobby explained. Let her not be afraid and come, Hector demanded. I don't care who she is. You know, your mother didn't have a higher education either. Where do you get these stereotypes from, son? Especially about your own father. No stereotypes at all, Dad. Bobby patted his father on the shoulder. Let's talk about it later, all right? Okay, I'll be waiting for your fiancé. But Bobby didn't rush to introduce his girlfriend. He constantly went to see her during breaks, returning home happy, with shining eyes full of excitement. In his sixth year, 
Bobby announced that his fiance would come when he graduated. We'll rent an apartment and live together, the young man dreamed. Why rent? Hector asked. Live here, four rooms, we'll manage somehow. Dad, is that convenient? Bobby hesitated. We, well, we don't want to inconvenience you, and what about children? Children are wonderful, son, Hector smiled. If you had asked my opinion, you would have known that I would like my grandchildren to live with me, you understand? During the winter break, Bobby went to see his fiance again, and he didn't come back home. He took a taxi to get from the station and got into an accident. Three days in intensive care. Doctors did everything they could, but they couldn't save Bobby. Hector nearly went crazy with grief. He had already made plans. He dreamed of going on countryside trips with his son's family, fishing with his grandchildren, and explaining to them that there is no better profession in the world than being a doctor. But now Hector was left alone. Completely alone. First he lost his wife, and now his son too. The man kept Bobby's room untouched. His books remained on the shelves, and his notes were scattered on the desk. Once, Hector was annoyed by the mess. Now he spent long hours in his son's room, examining his belongings and feeling endless longing. He didn't allow the housekeeper to change anything. She carefully dusted and returned notebooks, books, wristwatches, and other trinkets to their places. For years everything remained the same, in perfect order, Hector told Selma, just as it was when he left. Selma wiped away a tear. What a nightmare, she exclaimed. Oh my God, and Mom thought he just abandoned her, left her alone with the child. But, but how did you find out about me? It's funny. Hector smiled sadly. The maid forgot to close the window, and Bobby's desk was next to it. It poured rain that night, soaking his notebooks. I fired that girl, of course, in a fit of anger. Then I apologized, but she never came back. Anyway, I started going through his notebooks for the first time and found a photo. Hector opened the desk drawer and pulled out a picture, handing it to Selma. It was the same photo she had. A young dad and mom. Selma turned the photo over and saw the inscription. Sweetheart, today we learned that we'll have a son or daughter with love, mom and dad. And the date. Seven months before Selma's birth. She caught her breath. So her father wanted her, waited for her to come into the world. He just didn't get to see her. I hired private detectives, Hector continued, the best in their field. I wanted to find at least your mother, and I found you. You know, what surprised me the most is that you became a doctor too, Selma. It's a pity I didn't know about you earlier. You would have attended the best institute. The old man shook his gray head sorrowfully. Selma felt unbearable pity for him. I, I attended a good institute, she smiled. And I'm glad we met, even if it's now. After all, better late than never. That's how Selma found her grandfather, or rather, he found her. Selma took a two-week leave and spent it with Hector. She met his housekeeper, Catherine. Together, they packed Bobby's things into boxes and stored them in the attic. Hector decided that now it would be Selma's room. In the evenings, she would talk with her grandfather for a long time about everything under the sun. About science, about Bobby, about Hector's wife, Janet. Grandpa told Selma about his trips to infectious disease hotspots. She listened to his stories with a pounding heart, and then she went back home, happier than ever. Now she has a family. Yes, Hector is old, but they will spend many more years together. At least Selma sincerely hoped so. And Selma also got to know Catherine, Hector's housekeeper. They even became friends. They cooked together, went grocery shopping together. Selma sincerely liked Catherine. She was kind, open, ready to chat about anything. Selma even admitted once that she struggled a bit with her loneliness. They sat in the kitchen and drank tea together with Catherine. You're lucky, Catherine said. Hector is a very good person. He was so happy to find you. I think he was hoping a little that you had a family, kids, you know. By the way, what about your love life? He's eagerly awaiting grandchildren. Nothing, Selma's expression darkened. I haven't met that special someone yet. Maybe I never will. After all, I'm almost 30. But I believe in visualizing, Catherine winked at her. 
That's how I met my significant other. I just wrote down on a piece of paper what he should be like. And a month later, he sat down at my table in a cafe. Can you imagine, Selma, even his appearance matched? So, what kind of man are you looking for? Oh, I don't believe in that stuff, honestly. Selma waved her hand. But the universe hears our requests, Catherine insisted. Well, honestly, I don't even know what I want, Selma shrugged. Well, he should be kind, I guess. Love animals, but also smart. We need something to talk about, and he should have a good job. All right, what about appearance, Catherine persisted. That's important, too. Otherwise, you might meet someone smart, kind, loving, but a dwarf. But if I feel good with him, I don't care, Selma admitted honestly. I think it's silly to judge based on appearance. But still, Catherine's eyes lit up. It's interesting. Well, honestly, I've always liked blonde guys, Selma chuckled. I don't know why. They just seem beautiful to me, that's all. And they should wear those thick-knitted sweaters. I think men look so cute in them. Selma quickly forgot about that conversation with Catherine, and then Selma met her Robin. She often heard the expression that you can't escape fate, and she even believed it, thinking that she wouldn't miss her happiness for sure. And if she did miss it, then maybe it wasn't meant for her. After meeting Robin, she believed in it even more. It was a typical Sunday evening. Selma, as usual at this time, decided to go to the nearest supermarket to replenish her food supplies. Selma couldn't stand this activity. She didn't want to pay for delivery. So throwing on a light jacket and grabbing a canvas bag, Selma headed to the store. She stood in the fruits and vegetables section, picking green apples into a bag, when a tall, handsome guy suddenly approached her. Miss, could you help me? He asked sadly. What's the matter? Selma was surprised. Sinai. Well, I want to make chicken soup, but I don't know how to choose vegetables. He smiled disarmingly, and Selma noticed that he had unusually beautiful bright blue eyes. For some reason, it made her blush. Or was it his smile? Or his light blonde hair? Come on, Selma nodded. I'm not really good at this, but I usually succeed with chicken soup. Ah, uh, the guy sighed. But it's my first time cooking, and I'm really eager to try this homemade soup, but I have no one to cook it for me. Selma glanced suspiciously at the guy. No one? Absolutely, he nodded sadly. I live alone. And you? You seem so domestic, cozy. You can tell you know how to cook soup. Oh, sorry, I'm saying something strange, aren't I? No, no, it's fine, Selma mumbled. These, these vegetables will do. Enough for a big pot. What else do I need? How do you make broth? He asked. There are so many recipes on the internet and they're all different, you know? Okay, got it. Let's go to the meat department. Selma transferred the basket of groceries from one hand to the other. I'll explain everything to you. After half an hour, they were already standing at the checkout, chatting lively. It turned out the guy's name was Robin. He lives in the city center in a rented apartment and works as a programmer. Recently, Robin realized he was tired of ready-made food and wanted to learn how to cook by himself. Oh, I burned the chicken in the oven, he chuckled. The crust turned out crispy, just as promised. And the shade was so pleasant, noble, black. But I managed to make mashed potatoes. I thought the higher the temperature, the faster it would cook. Don't you remember what your mom used to cook? Selma asked. Robin's face darkened. I grew up without parents, he said. I'm sorry, I'm so sorry, she faltered. It's nothing. A smile returned to his face. So, do you live far? I have a car. I can give you a ride home. I live across the street, Selma said, packing the groceries into her bag. Now, oh, what a pity, Robin frowned. It was so nice talking to you, and I'll definitely need culinary advice. So, I have every right to ask for your phone number. The cashier, who was scanning Robin's items, winked at the flustered Selma. You can't refuse such a request, miss. Fine, Selma laughed. Okay then, but call me only for soup or chicken cooking questions. They parted ways at the supermarket exit. Robin promised to call soon when he decided to cook soup. And Selma agreed. She was in a cheerful mood. She really liked Robin. Handsome, smart, and a programmer. People like him, who understand such subtle matters, seemed almost like gods to her. Math was always difficult for her. 
and Robin grew up without parents. This added a touching touch to his portrait, making Selma suddenly want to warm him, support him, and maybe love him. But she didn't want to think about love. He was too good for her. Guys like him usually had no shortage of girls. But how to get rid of the thought that it was fate? A chance encounter in a supermarket, discussing soup, and then a wedding, three kids and a house by the sea, and of course a cute ginger dog with long ears. Thoughts of Robin filled Selma's mind throughout the next day. Her colleagues at work even noticed that her eyes sparkled in a special way. Selma joked about it, but she understood. She was in love. Just a little bit, maybe even childishly, but she hadn't felt such a feeling in so long that she sincerely rejoiced in it and almost wasn't afraid that Robin wouldn't call her. Although she waited for his call, like she used to wait for Christmas as a little girl, to see what gifts Santa left under the tree. Robin called. At first they chatted about soup, then the conversation turned to more personal topics, and then Robin asked her out on a date. And Selma agreed. He was perfect. Even wore the sweaters she liked, chunky knit, cozy. He loved to read, enjoyed contemporary indie films, which Selma didn't understand at all. But she loved talking to him about complex, smart movies. Selma fell completely in love after their very first date. On the third date, Robin confessed his feelings to her. I've never felt like this before, he said. It's like I've known you for a hundred years, like I've been searching for you my whole life. I sometimes think about that too, she whispered. You were looking for me, and I was waiting for you. Two months later, Selma decided to introduce her grandfather Hector to her beloved. The two of them came to stay with him for three days. Hector was reserved, which slightly frightened Selma. But Robin was, as always, perfect. He looked at her with loving eyes, spoke fittingly, and even gave Hector excellent expensive watches. In the evening, her grandfather asked Selma to come into his study. I wrote an article. Will you take a look at it with your young eyes? I've started missing mistakes, he sighed. Of course, Selma agreed, but her grandfather didn't show her any article. Selma, it's of course your business, he said softly, looking at her. But I don't like your young man. Why, she exclaimed, but he, he's just perfect. That's exactly what I don't like. Hector looked thoughtfully out the window. You know, dear, I've lived in this world for a long time. I know that perfect people don't exist. He seems... He seems like he's playing a role, do you understand? No, he's always like that. Selma raised her eyebrows. Really, Grandpa, really? What do you think, aren't there just good guys? Oh, I don't know, I don't know. Hector tapped his fingers on the tabletop. I'll say it again. I won't stand in your way and I'll bless your marriage. But I don't like him. Well, marriage isn't even on the table yet. Selma felt her cheeks flush but we were planning to move in together. May you be happy. Hector smiled gently, but his eyes still looked troubled. Know that I'm always on your side. Always. Selma quickly forgot the conversation with her grandfather. She was too happy, and Hector's fear could be understood. Grandpa worried about his only granddaughter, seeing every man who approached her as a potential threat. Robin moved in with Selma. They had to squeeze into a cramped one-bedroom apartment. Selma, it seemed spacious to her, but when Robin appeared, suddenly it felt cramped. One evening over dinner, he asked, Selma, what are your plans for the future? I don't know, she shrugged. I thought about starting my dissertation, and Grandpa keeps persuading me, saying there haven't been any doctors without a degree in our family, at least a PhD. No, darling, I'm not talking about that, Robin smiled. I'm talking about other plans. I was just thinking... Wait. He pulled something out of his pocket, stood up, and approached Selma's chair. I understand it all seems too fast, but I feel like I should do this. Selma, will you marry me? Selma dropped her fork on the table and laughed foolishly. Selma, Robin shook his head. I'm waiting for your answer. She looked into his eyes and, as always, felt like she was drowning in them. I do, she answered quietly. He slid a thin gold ring onto her finger and embraced her. Thank you, my love. I was afraid you'd think I'd gone mad, he whispered in her ear. What are you talking about? I won't think that, she replied. If anything, we're both crazy. 
A month later, they had a modest wedding. There wasn't enough money for a lavish celebration, and Selma refused to take money from her grandfather. Besides, what did they need an expensive restaurant, a limousine, and a lavish wedding dress for? The main thing was that they were now a family, a real one, and she was the wife of a man whom she didn't just love but adored and worshipped. Selma even felt awkward about how much she loved him, as if she had been saving up love her whole life and had now poured this beautiful feeling onto Robin, her perfect, best husband in the world. Two months after the wedding, Robin brought up the topic of a mortgage. Selma, kids will be coming soon, and the two of us will be cramped here. I'm earning decently, and you seem to be too. Let's take out a mortgage. I'm scared, Selma sighed, and we also need to save up for the down payment and that takes so long, and we won't save up much, so we'll have to take out a long-term mortgage, Robin. Selma, forgive me for saying this, Robin awkwardly lowered his eyes, but I thought we could sell this apartment and use that money for the down payment, huh? Selma resisted this idea for a long time. She loved her apartment. It was where her childhood passed and everything was in its place. It was convenient for her. Robin understood her and didn't insist, but the topic of a mortgage came up more and more often. And then, a coincidence decided everything. Robin called her from work, and Selma had the day off, enjoying the peace, reading silly magazines, and indulging in her favorite chocolate ice cream. Selma, come to the city center, Robin exclaimed excitedly. I found such an option. What are you talking about? She was taken aback. An option for what? My colleague, his sister, is a realtor, Robin said. He knows I'm looking for an inexpensive apartment. There's an option. The owners are leaving. They're selling urgently. It's one and a half times cheaper, and they're leaving all the furniture and appliances. Selma, please come now. Let's have a look. Robin, but we weren't planning on this yet, she protested. We can't miss out on this opportunity. Robin interrupted. We'll just take a look. It will only be officially listed the day after tomorrow. The Realtor says options like this at this price are snapped up within an hour, literally. Selma, dear, I'm begging you come. Selma agreed to go see it. Of course, she was sure they wouldn't buy the apartment. They didn't have the money yet. They had just started saving for the down payment. And she really didn't want to sell hers. Selma hoped they would manage to save up enough for a mortgage. They would move out and she would rent out her apartment. Hopefully, the rent would cover at least part of the monthly payments but Robin was so happy, as if he had won the lottery. If Selma refused now, he would definitely be upset or think that she didn't care about his dream of decent housing. But the apartment turned out to be truly wonderful, spacious, with high ceilings and a large balcony, where she could create a small garden, just as Selma had dreamed. The necessary furniture for living was there, as well as a spacious bathroom, a kitchen with new appliances. Selma understood her husband's enthusiasm, it was simply a gift from fate. If they missed out on such an opportunity because of her, she would never forgive herself. The cute realtor girl named the price. Robin nodded. We're taking it. We're taking it. Absolutely taking it. Are you sure, honey? Selma whispered. We don't have that much. I'm sure. He hugged her waist. This apartment is perfect, Selma. You've been dreaming of a garden on the balcony, and we can even put a chair and maybe even a small couch there. And the second room is so spacious, we'll make it into a nursery, right? He looked at her with such hope that Selma simply couldn't say no. She still had to sell her apartment. She was upset about it, even shed a few tears. But Selma resigned herself to it. You can't hold on to the old if you want to move forward. If they didn't take this apartment, they'd be stuck here for a long time. Someday they would indeed have children. And what? Would they live in one room with their parents? Of course, Robin was right. They needed a good, spacious apartment, especially at such a price. They moved soon after. To Selma's immense joy, Robin took care of all the paperwork himself. She didn't have to take time off work or deal with endless bureaucracy. Hector was happy for Selma, although he was a little disappointed. I would have given you the money, he said to her. Grandpa, you don't have that much, Selma laughed. Oh, you know a lot, sighed Hector. My textbook is published in several countries. I get good royalties. Well, let it be your money, Selma shook her head. 
I have to live independently and I want to solve my own problems. Oh, silly girl, Hector raised an eyebrow. And who do you think all this is for, Selma? For years I didn't know what would happen after my death. With all this, with the apartment, the country house, the money. Selma, it's all yours, or will be yours. What difference does it make if you take the money in a few years or take it now? Please, don't talk like that, Selma was frightened. You'll live for a long time yet. You'll enjoy these money with your great-grandchildren. Selma did like the new apartment after all. There was so much more space, and the renovation was quite nice, done with taste. Selma even found a bottle of cologne left by the previous owner. The same one her husband used. It amused her. She thought it was a real sign from destiny. This was truly their apartment with Robin. They needed to enjoy the moment, not mourn their old apartment. One day Selma came to visit her grandfather. He was working in his office. She went to prepare lunch. Soon, Katrine, having finished cleaning, joined Selma. How's the move going? Katrine asked. It's all done, Selma replied, slicing the beef. We're settling in. It feels strange to me. I've lived in cramped spaces my whole life, and now we have such a spacious apartment. You're lucky, Katherine squinted. You found a good husband and an apartment, and it will all be yours one day. You know, I don't think about that, Selma admitted honestly. I'm just glad that Grandpa found me, and I hope he'll live for a long time. Oh, come on, it's time to think about it, Katherine laughed. Don't be a child. I wish I had that. Some people have to struggle on their own. What do you mean? Selma put down the knife. I didn't know that Hector was my grandfather. Even if he were just a simple locksmith, I would still be glad that we met. I'm sorry, Catherine suddenly wrinkled her nose. I just never understood why some people have it so easy, while others have to work hard and barely make ends meet. I'm sorry. We don't know what the future holds. Maybe you'll marry an oligarch and I'll envy you. You're quite a beautiful woman. I only inherited beauty, Catherine waved her hand. The village is first beauty. Since I was 14, guys wouldn't leave me alone. My mom kept saying, find a rich man so you don't have to work. I thought I found one. We met online and in the photos, he looked so impressive next to a car. But when I went to his city, turns out he was poor. The car wasn't his. He had one decent suit and even that was only in the photo. What a nightmare, Selma sympathized. Well, I lived with him for a year, and then I left. Got tired of living poorly. You know, when there's no money, you start thinking, maybe there's some cash tucked away in the autumn jacket? Hmm. Catherine chuckled. You probably wouldn't know. You're still young. I do. Selma was surprised. My mom and I lived very poorly. It got easier when I started working. Well, then you know. Catherine took a red pepper from the plate and started slicing it into strips. And I way, I left that guy and didn't know what to do. Go back to the village. I'm a young girl. I want to develop. I want to live nicely. I started working, worked as a model for a while. Thought they'd pay good money. Posed for catalogs, on my feet all day, changing clothes, and they paid peanuts. Then I met my second Alan. We lived okay with him. He earned well, gave expensive gifts, by the way. He kept saying, we'll get married soon. We'll get married soon. Catherine fell silent, tensely, staring ahead. And then? Selma asked. Well, nothing. Turns out he had a wife, two kids. I even believed he'd leave his wife for me. Then I found out that his whole business was tied to her cunning, Catherine said. He dumped me. Said I nagged him too much to divorce his wife. And now? Selma suddenly felt terribly sorry for this woman. Poor Catherine. With such experience, you wouldn't want any relationships. And now there's one, Catherine smiled. He's good, just poor, but it's okay. He's talented. He'll earn. We'll have an apartment and Selma, a country house. See? Selma winked at Catherine. Everything will definitely work out for you. The woman nodded and continued cutting the peppers. After that conversation, Selma became even more attached to Catherine. She sympathized with her and hoped that sooner or later, Catherine would also find her happiness, just like Selma did. And now she's rushing home to her beloved husband, or rather not entirely to him. She needs to hurry up, buy groceries, cook something tasty, tidy up. 
When Robin was away, Selma was terribly lazy about keeping the place clean. But upon his return, she always tried to clean every corner of the apartment. She liked to think that he noticed her efforts and felt how eagerly Selma awaited her husband's return from business trips. Ah, it's a pity that lately his business trips have become more frequent. Robin leaves almost every month for a week or two. What can you do? He's about to get promoted. Well, I have to try my best, but then his salary will be higher. Right now, it's barely enough to cover the mortgage and make ends meet. Of course, Grandpa often offered Selma help, but she refused. She didn't want Hector to even think that Selma was using him for selfish purposes. As she walked home, Selma looked forward to it. She'll catch some sleep after her shift, then go to the store. Maybe it's worth buying a whole chicken and baking it in the oven and making soup. After all, they met because of soup. So Selma cooks it regularly to remind Robin of that romantic moment that brought them together. It wouldn't hurt to go to the hair salon and trim the ends either. Catherine says Selma should get a haircut. And Catherine never gives bad advice. Although she's a bit older than Selma, she looks very attractive indeed. Selma entered the apartment, kicked off her sneakers and looked in the mirror. Oh my, how does Robin live with her? Pale, with bags under her eyes, all disheveled? Selma pulled down her lower eyelids and stuck out her tongue. Just a scary witch. But no worries, a few hours of sleep and she'll be as good as new. She quickly took a shower, threw on a robe, entered the bedroom, and was stunned. Robin's back and he didn't warn me. Broad shoulders, long legs, he always stretches one leg out from under the blanket. Selma joked that it helps with better thermoregulation. Selma wanted to wake her husband up, but changed her mind. With a smile, she quietly opened the closet and pulled out her favorite hoodie pajamas with cat ears. Robin just adores it when she wears them, calls her his little kitten, and finds it terribly endearing. Selma dropped the robe, put on the pajamas, and shook her hair. There, now she's ready to meet her husband. Well, Robin, you trickster. Didn't even warn me that he'd be back from his business trip earlier. She sneaked up to the bed and lay down next to her husband. She ran her hand down his back, then planted a kiss between his shoulder blades. His warm body was comforting, and she didn't realize when she fell asleep. Waking up, Selma looked at the wall clock. Wow, it's almost six in the evening. How deeply I slept. Nothing surprising. Selma always slept especially well next to her beloved Robin. Selma smiled. Robin's arm wrapped around her waist. She felt his steady breathing and the scent, the minty fresh aroma of the shower gel she loved so much. Selma reached out and rolled onto her side to kiss her husband and wake him up. And then she was stunned. It wasn't Robin. A stranger, a bald man, was embracing her. Selma screamed and pushed the man away sharply. He opened his eyes and looked at her with confusion. Who are you? Selma croaked. What are you doing here? Me? He rubbed his eyes and squinted. Wait, who are you? Selma realized that she was still lying next to a stranger who somehow got into her house and she tried to get up but got tangled in the blanket and fell to the floor. Jumping up abruptly, she pressed her back against the closet. The man watched her with a calm, stone-faced expression. I, I'll call the police, she threatened. I'll do the same, miss. He pulled his knees to his chin and rubbed his neck with his hand. How did you end up here? I live here, actually, Selma stammered. This is my apartment. What are you doing here? Oh, my God. The man looked thoughtfully out the window. This has never happened before. So I'm calling the police, Selma exclaimed. Wait a minute, miss. The man reached out. We'll figure this out with you right now. He threw off the blanket and Selma realized that the man was completely naked. Goosebumps ran over her skin. So she slept next to a stranger and he was naked, completely naked. Should she consider it cheating? The thought seemed funny to Selma, and she chuckled foolishly. The man glanced at her. What's so funny? She didn't reply. He shrugged, picked up his jeans from the floor, stood up, and turned away from Selma to get dressed. Although she had already seen enough, maybe she was just dreaming. She would wake up now, go to the supermarket for groceries, unpack them into the fridge, and spend the rest of the day reading. Because what was happening was too absurd to be true. And she chuckled again. Should we call not only the police but also a doctor? The man asked with concern. 
I'm a doctor myself, Selma said for some reason. Pleasure to meet you, doctor. The man adjusted his jeans and sighed sadly. When will all this end? Say, and have you ever experienced anything like this before? For some reason, Selma wasn't scared, but rather amused. But all this amusement, it was abnormal. She felt like she was about to burst into laughter and wouldn't stop until she stopped breathing. No, nothing like this ever happened, but just, so miss, could you please explain what you're doing here? Craig brought you, right? Well, good job, of course. But why did you lie down next to me? I don't understand. I don't know any, Craig. Selma leaned against the closet because her legs couldn't support her anymore. Maybe introduce yourself, huh? The man sat down in the armchair near the wall, crossing one leg over the other. The couch separated them, and Selma felt relatively safe. Plus, the man reminded her of someone, terribly so, as if she had already seen him somewhere, but where? Well, my name is Robin, and yours. I'm Selma, Selma Teller, she introduced herself. Ah, okay, now Selma, I'd like to hear the story of how you ended up here and in such a strange outfit. Selma remembered that she was still wearing her cat pajamas, but why did his face seem so familiar? That's I live here, are you like in a movie or something, mixed up apartments? If so, I'll let you go, and of course won't call the police. I'm just curious, how did you get in? Selma, I live here too. Trust me, I entered using this key. And are you another one of Craig's girls? I don't know any Craig, Selma crossed her arms over her chest. I live here with my husband, got the apartment on a mortgage, sold my own apartment. Is that enough for you? Suddenly, Selma's phone, which she had placed near the pillow, rang. She flinched. Answer it, Robin suggested. What if it's something important? She obediently picked up the phone. It was Catherine calling. Selma, Selma, it's terrible, the woman shouted. Hector, he's in the hospital. Very bad. Hurry up. Oh my God, Selma whispered. She sank to the floor. What's wrong with Grandpa? I don't know, I don't know, Catherine replied. It's either a heart attack or something with his brain. The ambulance took him. No one knows anything. He felt nauseous all evening yesterday, and now this. Please go. Yes, yes, okay, I'll come. Selma closed her eyes and felt a tear roll down her cheek. No, this must be a nightmare. The worst nightmare of her life. What happened? Robin asked. Selma looked up at him. Grandpa is not well. He's hospitalized. Oh my God. He approached her and squatted down. Girl, I understand everything. Craig must have talked you into something. He's done it before. I'm not mad. Do you want me to take you to the hospital to see your grandpa? Selma stared at Robin incredulously. Why are you silent? I have a car. I can take you. Then we'll talk and figure everything out, he insisted. Are you feeling unwell? Maybe some water? Can you really take me? Selma asked. Yes, I can since I'm offering. He stood up and reached out his hand. Let's go, and I'll deal with Craig myself. Don't worry. I don't know any Craig. I'm telling you again. Selma struggled to her feet and shook off her pajamas. I'm ready to go. Right now? The man skeptically asked. I think you might be misunderstood a little if you show up at the hospital in this cat costume. Selma realized she was still dressed in her silly pajamas. I'll change now. Robin nodded and left the bedroom. With trembling hands, Selma pulled out jeans and a t-shirt from the wardrobe and quickly put them on. Grandpa, will she lose him? No. Too quickly it can't be. They haven't talked about everything yet. Not everything has been discussed. They'll definitely save Grandpa in the hospital. It can't be otherwise. He promised to wait for his great-grandchildren. Thoughts of Hector distracted Selma from the situation with the unknown man in her marital bed. However, he hadn't done anything wrong to Selma, hadn't threatened, kicked out, or harassed her. She would think about it later. First, Grandpa. Robin waited for Selma in the hallway, tossing the car keys in his palm. So, Kitty, ready to go? He smiled. Don't call me that, please, Selma said. I have a name. All right, Selma Teller. Robin's car, a gray Range Rover, was parked right under the windows. Selma got into the back seat. Thoughts jumbled in her head due to nerves, her mouth felt dry, and an unpleasant lump formed in her throat. The car smoothly set off down the road. Selma, I'll still ask, Robin began gently. Or was it not Robin at all? Ask about what? How did you end up in my apartment? 
I think the story is standard. Craig has done it a hundred times already, but still I want to hear your version. I've found slightly different ladies here before. You don't seem to be like them. Like what? Selma burst out. I don't understand. I don't even understand why I agreed to go anywhere with you. Got it, got it, said Robin. He took a bottle of water from the glove compartment and handed it to Selma. Have a drink, please. Calm down, then we'll talk. And I'll personally tear Craig's head off. My father used to say you shouldn't leave him alone for long. Selma didn't listen to the man's grumbling. She was thinking about Grandpa. I wonder if she can transfer him to the hospital where she works. That would be better. She could keep an eye on him. Then Selma realized. She had completely forgotten about her husband. If this man was in his place, then where was he? The woman reached into her jeans pocket and dialed her husband's number. Long rings. She counted ten rings, but Robin didn't pick up. Then she pressed the end call button. He often didn't answer when he was at work. It wasn't feasible to answer during an important meeting. She dialed his number again, and once again, he didn't answer. Selma sent a message. Darling, please call back when you have time. Why isn't he here when she needs him so much? And yet, perhaps Selma was a bad granddaughter. Grandpa had been complaining of headaches and weakness for a week now. Selma carefully checked his blood pressure, but it was within the normal range. Hector flat out refused to be examined, didn't like hospitals even though he was a doctor himself. It's often the case. Doctors may overlook their own ailments and let their illnesses progress. Although Selma was the same. Once she went to work with pneumonia, and she thought she was just tired, couldn't see the obvious. Selma herself had been feeling not very well lately, especially before her husband left. There was a strange weakness. It became difficult to get out of bed in the mornings. Sometimes she felt nauseous. She even thought she might be pregnant, but the test showed only one line. It got better when Robin left. She even thought she might be allergic to her own husband. We're here, Robin said at that moment. This is the hospital, right? Yes, I did my internship here, she said for some reason. Thank you. Let's go. He got out of the car and gallantly opened the door for her. Are you going with me? Selma was surprised. You look terrible the whole way. I can't just leave you and then drive you back home. Where do you live? You know where I live, Selma said, stepping out of the car. She slammed the door. Robin winced. Raised without a father? Why? She looked at him puzzled. Because a father would slap you for that. You have to close the door carefully. All right, let's go to your grandpa. They entered the lobby. Selma hurried to the reception desk and found out that her grandfather had been admitted to the intensive care unit. Can I see him? She asked. No, you can't. The receptionist narrowed her eyes, thickly lined with black pencil. Do you see the time? It's seven in the evening. Visitors are allowed from one to two. I really need to. Tears welled up in Selma's eyes. At least to talk to a doctor. It's my grandfather in there. I don't know anything. The woman snapped, slamming the magazine in front of her shut. Come back tomorrow. The doctor won't see you. Miss, is there anything we can do? Robin nudged Selma with his shoulder. A charming smile appeared on his face, and the stern expression on the receptionist's face turned into a friendly one. Well, you see, if... If I let everyone in like this, I'll get in trouble, she said. Those are our rules. Well, come back tomorrow, please. And what if... Robin pulled out his wallet and took out a bill. The bill quickly found its way into the pocket of the receptionist's gown. Selma didn't even notice how it happened. Oh, all right. The woman sighed heavily. But at your own risk. The doctor might refuse to speak with you. Give me your names. They stepped away from the counter. Robin handed Selma the pass. Here, yours. Are you by any chance my husband's namesake? Selma asked. Husband? Robin was taken aback. Hmm. Getting more interesting by the hour. What's so interesting? Do you think I can't be married? Selma said. And why did you do that? Do what? Robin followed her. Are you coming with me? Well, I am, or else you might run away, and I need to find out a lot about your relationship with apparently your lawful husband. By the way, I'm also not aware of how you ended up in my apartment, in my bed, I mean, in ours. Well, let's discuss that, he said. 
The intensive care unit was located on the second floor. Selma hesitantly pressed the doorbell. Five minutes later, the door slid open, and Selma saw her colleague, a man in his fifties, dressed in a time-yellowed gown. Who are you here for? The doctor exclaimed, surprised. Visiting hours are over? Hello, I'm here about Hector Egerton, Selma began, stuttering. Oh, come back tomorrow, the doctor rolled his eyes. Didn't they tell you at the reception? Well, please, she sobbed. I'm a doctor myself, a general practitioner. I understand everything. I just really want to see my grandfather. All right, all right, the doctor said. But I can't promise you'll see him. His condition is stable but serious, myocardial infarction. We're doing everything we can. I can't say more. We're following protocols. Medications are available. And don't cry, he's a tough old man. Can you tell me if he'll recover? Selma asked. Colleague, you understand that I can't promise anything? The doctor gently patted her on the shoulder. Wait and come back tomorrow at nine in the morning. I'll let you in to see your grandfather. He'll wake up by then. Selma thanked the doctor, and together with Robin, they headed to the parking lot. How's your grandfather doing? He asked. You heard it all, she replied grimly. We also say the same things to relatives. We do everything we can. The condition is stable. What else can it be? I wish I could see his test results. Will you call your parents, or maybe I can take you to them? I don't have parents, Selma sighed. Goodness, why do you care about my family? I haven't figured out yet how you broke into my house. Maybe you'll tell me? Maybe I will. They reached his car. Robin gallantly opened the front door for Selma. Get in, where should I take you? Take me home, she frowned. Stop this circus for God's sake. Listen, maybe you conspired with my husband? I mean, with your namesake? And you decided to play me like this? The prank has gone too far, and I think it's time for all of us to admit it. I suggest we go back to my place. Well, I mean our place, apparently. There I'll tell you everything, and then you can decide for yourself, Robin said, getting behind the wheel and inserting the key into the ignition. I'm not very keen on sitting alone with a strange man in an apartment, Selma told him. Well, wait. You're sitting alone with me in the car, actually, Robin reminded her. No, I would have preferred to get to know each other under different circumstances. But since it's turned out this way, we can go to my grandfather's house. I have the key. Catherine, the housekeeper, should be there. Let's talk in front of witnesses. Is that okay? Selma crossed her arms over her chest and attempted to give Robin a threatening look. Apparently, it didn't work because his face remained impassive. Let's go, he nodded. Give me the address. Selma dictated her grandfather's address and called Catherine. She was indeed in Hector's house. I got held up, wanted to finish cleaning, she sighed. It feels empty without him. Selma, how is he doing? Fine, Selma replied. I'll be there soon with an acquaintance. Just one acquaintance? Robin chuckled when Selma hung up. Seems modest for someone you let's say woke up with in bed. What will your husband say? He'll say you're a scoundrel who broke into our apartment, Selma replied. For some reason, Robin didn't evoke fear in the woman. Or perhaps it was all due to the strange resemblance to her husband. She noticed more and more similar features. For example, the smile, the color of the eyes, the shape of the face, even the small earlobes were the same. Only the hairstyle was different. Something was off. And Selma had to figure out what exactly happened. No. Most likely, it was just a silly coincidence. How many times had she heard or read stories about dishonest realtors who rented out the same apartment to multiple people? Probably, something similar had happened here. And she even felt sorry for Robin. He probably wanted to rent an apartment but got caught up in a scam. Selma had no doubts that it was just a mistake. All the documents for the apartment were in her drawer, in a folder. Her husband made mortgage payments diligently every month. They arrived at Hector's house. Getting out of the car, Robin whistled. Wow, not bad. Is your grandfather some local official? No, he's actually a scientist, Selma replied, taking out the keys from her pocket. An epidemiologist. Come on. Catherine was in the kitchen preparing dinner. Her eyes were red. Selma understood. The woman had been crying. Poor thing. 
she must be deeply attached to Hector. After sending Catherine to the living room, Selma sat down at the table. Robin sat across from her. So, what can I say? Fantastic apartment, he said. Why don't you live with your grandfather? Because I live with my husband, Selma exclaimed. And why is it any of your business? Well, technically it's not, Robin raised his hands as if surrendering. But I need your version of what happened, and then I'll give you mine. And something tells me, Selma, it's going to be entertaining. Yeah, hilariously entertaining, Selma sighed. As fun as it gets. She told him everything. About Robin. About buying the apartment. About the documents she could present if her interlocutor didn't believe her words. And are you listed in the documents too? Robin asked after listening to Selma. Not yet, the woman admitted. There were some difficulties with that. I didn't really delve into it. My husband dealt with it. We were planning to handle it together this winter. You know, there are cues, and we both work a lot, you understand? Yeah, I understand, Robin leaned back in his chair. Yeah, it's crazy, of course. I thought Craig was capable of a lot, but I never expected him to pull something like this off. Listen, who is this Craig anyway? Selma burst out. Why do we keep talking about Craig all the time, and you don't even explain how he's related to this story at all? I just don't understand, honestly. You'd better admit it's just a mistake. Who rented you this apartment? Craig, maybe. Oh, I knew we should have changed the locks. But Robin said later, Later. No money now. Yeah, he messed up, I have to admit. Robin chuckled. Selma, what I'm about to tell you will surprise you greatly. It may even turn your world upside down. And what could you possibly tell me? Selma skeptically inquired. I already understand everything perfectly. Well, okay, I'll start from the beginning. I think you should know, after all, we're family. It seems you're even my wife, the first and only one. I can't imagine how to fix all this now. Robin, you... you're insane, Selma sighed. But you can't just say it like that. Listen, maybe I should call an ambulance for you. What kind of husband are you? To me, I'm seeing you for the first time. I'm seeing you for the first time, too. Robin tiredly rubbed his nose. And I don't have questions for you. I have them for my brother. But listen to me first. And then decide whether to call an ambulance or firefighters or the police. Robin was born into an unusual family. His father was a fairly average architect but made good money. His mother, on the other hand, was a spiritual woman who adored all kinds of exotic teachings and self-improvement practices. Robin had a younger brother, Craig. Craig was their mother's favorite. In Robin's childhood, this hurt terribly. His mother had long conversations with Craig, always took him to meetings with colleagues on the spiritual path, praised him for everything he did. From childhood drawings to the C he got at school, even C's were, in his mother's eyes, an indication that her son didn't care what the gray masses thought of him. Grades aren't everything, his mother would say with a tender smile. What matters is who you are, and I'm glad you understand that. Robin, on the other hand, was expected to excel academically. It was his father who expected this, of course. His mother couldn't care less about her elder son's grades. Only when he became a teenager did Robin learn that, to his mother, he was nothing more than a failed first attempt. It turned out she had calculated the optimal birth date for her son with the help of a well-known astrologer in town. And Robin was born a week later than the estimated due date. And he turned out to be not a Scorpio but a Sagittarius. But the second attempt turned out to be successful. Mom believed that the younger son would be almost a new messiah. She read him spiritual literature, never restricting him in anything. Dad looked at his wife's whims with a smirk scolded occasionally, saying he would spoil the boy, but he didn't interfere with the upbringing process. He quickly realized that it was useless. The wife threw terrible tantrums whenever he tried to persuade her to set some boundaries for their son. Eventually, the man gave up. It seemed they had divided their sons. Robin got his father's share, while Craig got his mother's. Craig quickly realized that his position had several undeniable advantages. He manipulated his mother as he pleased. When he turned eight, she spent part of the family's savings to buy him some incredible toy car. The car was indeed magnificent. It wasn't just for solo rides. It could also carry one small passenger. It was dark red with large rubber wheels. 
Every boy dreamed of such a toy, including Robin. But his father explained to the elder son that they didn't have the money for such luxury, and there wouldn't be any. They were saving up for a trip to the sea, so there was no point even thinking about the car. But his mother still bought it for her beloved son. That was when Robin's parents almost had their first serious argument, close to divorce. You're spoiling him. You can't do that, the father yelled. He doesn't know the meaning of refusal. I attended the school meeting. The teachers complain. He does whatever he wants. He walks out of the classroom when he feels like it. He eats during class. What's that? He's a free spirit, not a slave of the system, the mother objected. You're used to walking straight and want everyone else to be the same. But our younger son, he's different. He has the sun in Scorpio and the moon in Cancer in his natal chart. He will change the world. God, what Scorpios and Cancers? The father rubbed his temple. You'll spoil him. He's very bad at studying. So what? Are grades more important to you than our son's happiness, huh? The mother asked. He's unique. One of a kind. There won't be another like him for a thousand years. You just don't understand. Fool. Robin also tried to talk to his brother that evening. Listen, why? We wanted to go to the sea. So what? Craig smirked cunningly then. Don't you like the toy car? You wanted it too, didn't you? I do, Robin grumbled. But it's expensive, Dad said. And Mom said there's money. Craig's smile widened even more, and that we'll go to the sea later. But they never went to the sea. The father was offended and no longer trusted money to his wife. He contributed to household expenses and saved the rest. She also harbored resentment but explained her behavior by saying that he couldn't obstruct Craig's unique personality development. Only the mother noticed this uniqueness. Craig grew up and became smarter, realizing that he could achieve a lot without making much effort. For example, he just had to tell his mother that he constantly felt anxiety and heaviness in his chest, and she immediately gave him money for pocket expenses or allowed him to skip school. At school, he managed to befriend the top students, although calling it friendship was difficult. Craig simply bought soda and sweets with the money his mother gave him and in exchange got completed homework. Good grades, a satisfied father and no effort required. Sometimes Craig asked for help from his brother. Robin, of course, helped. He had no choice. If he refused, Craig immediately complained to their mother. Not about refusing to solve an equation for him. He claiming that his brother hit him or called him a bad name, and then Robin would be punished by their mother. Craig watched this, satisfied with himself, with an innocent smile on his face. That's how the two children grew up in the same family, as different as possible. Robin was used to achieving everything on his own. First he posted advertisements, then he worked at the car wash. Craig, on the other hand, knew how to manipulate people and by adolescence he had become so adept at it that even an experienced psychologist would hardly see through him. His tricks didn't work on their father, though, and Craig, knowing this, hardly interacted with him. But his mother was ready to move mountains for her son, as long as he grew up to be who she thought he should be, a person who would change history, for the better, of course. Robin finished school and entered university to study geophysics. Craig didn't want to study. He believed that education was for idiots who didn't know how to live life correctly. Naturally, in Craig's opinion, fate itself should take care of his well-being. The main thing was to be in the right place at the right time and meet the right people. And so the paths of the brothers diverged. Robin moved into the dormitory. At home, he still felt lonely, but at university, he found new friends with whom he felt much more comfortable than with his father, mother, and brother. Craig also decided to continue his education. He initially enrolled in engineering but dropped out. Studying was too difficult, and classmates refused to do his assignments for him. He then enrolled in philology, but also failed the first session. Robin lived his own life and hardly communicated with his brother. Occasionally, he called his mother to check in, visited once a month. And then Craig suddenly married a woman who was nearly twice his age. She was 42. For some reason, Robin wasn't invited to the wedding. The mother was ecstatic. Craig's wife was just like her, passionate about esoterics and mysticism. It seemed like Craig had found a kindred spirit, and his wife would help him in his spiritual development and the refinement of his unique free personality. Plus, the wife had her own apartment, which was a bonus in the father's eyes, who had grown tired of his son. 
Maybe he'll wise up with her, the father said to Robin when he asked why he didn't object to the marriage. Robin, I can't take it anymore, the father would say. Your mother keeps talking about how amazing and magnificent he is, and Craig just keeps asking for money. I need a break from him. Robin didn't like his father's stance. He was sure that if he wanted to, his father could set Craig straight and have a serious talk with their mother. But apparently, it was too late. Craig wouldn't change now. A year after the wedding, Craig's wife died, falling from the balcony on the 10th floor. Craig wasn't home at the time. He had a solid alibi. He was sitting in a cafe with a friend, which was recorded on surveillance cameras. Craig returned to his parents' apartment. His wife had left her apartment to the church in her will. Once, Robin went to visit his father and mother, but he found only his brother there. Their parents were not home. Craig suggested they have tea, and Robin agreed. Initially, the conversation in the kitchen was about trivial matters. Robin talked about his job. He had gotten a position at a research institute, gaining experience and knowledge. And Craig mentioned his plans to continue his education. Maybe I'll study to become a programmer, he said. <laughs> well, it's hard to study there and there's fierce competition, Robin countered. Craig, stop building castles in the air. Go to college, at least to become a driller. It's shift work, three months up north. Then you'll have money for the whole year. I'll help you get a job. Craig frowned in response. Well, yeah, work for three people for that low salary. Robin, you're a part of the system, but I believe you need to rise above it. Those above the system see more, which means they have more opportunities. You get it? Didn't seem like you noticed that with your wife, slipped out from Robin, and he immediately scolded himself mentally. Maybe his brother really loved his wife and hid his pain from the world? Oh, you jerk, said Craig. Did you hear what she did with the apartment? Promised to leave it to me and lied. What are you saying? Robin couldn't believe his ears. The woman is dead. Oh, she was nuts, sighed Craig. I didn't realize how much. Anything happened, she'd cry right away, threatened to do something to herself. I told her, go to a psychiatrist, you need to take pills. And she said, no, meditation will help me. Well, as you can see, it didn't help. Okay, let's talk about something else. How's your personal life? The way Craig spoke with such malice about his deceased wife scared Robin then. Even some bad thoughts emerged. What if Craig was responsible for her death? But thinking about it was terrifying. Robin believed that his brother was not capable of hurting anyone. Yes, he was cunning. Yes, a manipulator. But he definitely wouldn't have killed his wife. Robin really wanted to believe that. So much so that he did. Though doubts lingered in his soul but the police found no reason to suspect him, and therefore Robin had no reason to think that his younger brother had done something terrible. Then Craig got married again. Robin liked his wife, a cute girl, a bit naive, who came from the countryside, speaking with a funny accent. Her name was Meryl. There was hope that Craig would finally mature. They lived in a rented apartment, which suited Meryl just fine. Craig got a job at a phone store selling phones. Meryl worked as a preschool teacher, at that time, Robin often went on long business trips, visited the north, walked through the forest with a huge backpack, lived in a tent for weeks. He hardly communicated with his family. Returning home, Robin only had time to rest and write reports on his work. One expedition followed another. Robin learned about Merrill leaving Craig only two years after their wedding, from their mother. She called him and casually mentioned that his brother had returned to the family. How so? What about Merrill? Robin was surprised. She left him, poor thing, probably found someone else, his mother replied. Couldn't understand his soul, his finesse. You know, I knew it right away, that's how it would be. Meryl was too simple for him. A country girl, the woman spoke venomously. Robin didn't believe in such a turn of events. Meryl looked at Craig with loving eyes, listened to his every word. Why would she choose to leave him voluntarily? Robin decided to talk to his brother, he invited Craig to a bar. He had a knack for it. A small amount of alcohol made Craig talk a little more. Knowing this trait of his, Craig hardly ever drank. Robin managed to persuade his brother to have a couple of drinks. What about Merrill? Robin asked when he realized that his brother was in the right mood. She betrayed me, Craig frowned. 
I had it all planned out, wanted to improve our lives, and she... What about her? Robin insisted. Well, I had it all planned out. Craig slammed his fist on the table. All she had to do was endure, and we would have bought a nice apartment, and everything would have been fine. Just endure for nine months. You wanted to sell a child? Robin asked. No, not ours. I wanted her to be a surrogate mother. I found out everything, even found people who were willing. Craig looked helplessly at his brother. And is that bad? Everyone gives birth, but Merrill couldn't. Hold on, hold on. You need to have your own child for that, Robin said. Did you miscalculate something, little brother? That's how it should have been. You know, just endure a little. The wife of that guy is infertile. He liked Merrill, but she didn't want to. I even invited him over to talk one-on-one. -on -one. But she left after that, Craig explained. Listen, Craig, you're insane, Robin said. You need to undergo long and persistent treatment. You're the crazy one, Craig got offended. Many people do this, but she can't. She needs to give birth a lot. She has hips like this. Craig spread his hands to show how wide Merrill's hips were. Robin struggled to refrain from slapping his brother. Good Lord, where did he get such thoughts from? Why should Merrill sacrifice her health to please Craig? Unbelievable. Robin suddenly realized then that their mother had created a monster. Someone who didn't care about the feelings of others and who devoutly believed that the main task of those around him was to please him. Otherwise, what are all these people for? And will you lend me some money? Robin asked Craig as if to confirm his thoughts. I need a little little brother. No, Craig, I won't lend you any. Robin stood up and put on his jacket. See you, little brother. In the evening, his mother called him and scolded him for refusing to lend money to his brother. You get paid a lot, don't you? She grumbled. You can't spare some. Craig has problems, you know, with earning money. His main problem is that he doesn't work, Robin said. Usually, people who work also earn money, Mom. He can't, he can't just work anywhere, his mother exclaimed. The level of development, the level of vibrations is too high. Robin couldn't take it anymore and for the first time in his life ended the conversation with his mother without saying goodbye. He has vibrations. She doesn't see that Craig is laughing at her, at her confidence in his uniqueness. Robin can't convince mom otherwise. Craig is her unique boy, that's all. Her main creation and achievement. And dad, he stopped paying attention to it and thinks Craig will grow up sooner or later. It will never happen. Don't wait for it. Time passed. Robin earned enough for an apartment in the city center, furnished it as he wanted, dreamed of getting married, becoming a father. But things didn't work out with women. No one could withstand his long absences, and Robin couldn't imagine life without his beloved work. He tried to switch to a calm position and sit in an office processing data. But after six months of boredom, he screamed, decided, and quit. Deep down, the man hoped that one day he would meet that special someone and when he saw her, his heart would beat strongly and he would know it was her. Because if that happened, then she would also love him for who he is, and it couldn't be otherwise. But that special someone never appeared, and the apartment stood empty for a long time. Robin didn't want to let in tenants. He couldn't bear the thought of strangers living in his beloved bachelor pad touching his things, using the carefully chosen furniture. No, this was his and only his den. Only the girl he would someday call his wife would enter here. One day, returning from a business trip, Robin found a young lady in the apartment. The lady was sitting in the kitchen, smoking a thin cigarette and elegantly flicking the ash into a porcelain cup. Robin felt offended. Who are you? Are you Craig's brother? He said you could come. The lady calmly replied. You have nowhere to stay. What? I have somewhere to stay. Robin felt he was about to boil with anger. But Craig apparently had nowhere else to bring you. Do you understand? The thing is, this is my apartment. Not his. Mine. The lady's blue eyes widened. Wait, this is Craig's apartment. She said. The cigarette ash fell onto the kitchen table. Robin grimaced. Could you be a bit more careful, please? He said. The girl ignored his words. I'm calling my fiancé, she proudly announced, and he'll talk to you. Yeah, go ahead, call your fiancé, Robin sighed, sinking into a chair. 
He didn't sleep all night. He had been traveling by train. He didn't have the energy for these disputes. Soon, it turned out the lady's name was Ashley. Craig assured her that the apartment belonged to him, and Robin was his loser brother, who had nowhere to live and could stay with him. After hearing this version of events, Robin kicked Ashley out, then called his mother. She admitted she had given Craig a copy of the keys. You don't live there anyway for half a year, she said. You feel sorry for it? Mom, do you know anything about private property at all? Robin asked. That's it. It has always been like this, the mother tragically sighed. You only think about earthly material things. You even feel sorry for an empty apartment, Robin. You're a typical consumer. Mom, isn't Craig your consumer too? Doesn't he need an apartment? Robin politely asked. If so, why did he occupy my territory? Well, if he's not a consumer, can't you just come to an agreement, his mother advised. Ah, I see. Listen, maybe I should buy an apartment for your spiritual Craig, with my own money, huh? Robin suggested. Understand, he just doesn't think about it. He's troubled by other thoughts. He's in love. He needed to be somewhere with his beloved girl and enjoy her, his mother said. Robin couldn't take it anymore and said goodbye. Talking to Craig himself didn't yield any results either. You feel sorry for it? His brother asked. So what? We live together for a bit. Why lie to her then? Robin said. You could have just said it was someone else's apartment. You know these women. Craig waved his hand. They're attracted to houses, to cars. An unpleasant smile appeared on his face. And you saw her, Robin. Admit it. She was worth it. Robin wanted to change the locks but changed his mind. If he did... Craig could use lockpicks. Besides, he feared his mother would go crazy and say something about how Robin's grounded energy didn't accept Craig's elevated vibrations. Robin began to understand his father, who once chose not to interfere with the spiritual development of his younger son, let him live with whoever he wants, and after getting a promise from his brother to kick out his girlfriends from Robin's apartment before Robin returned from his next business trip, he calmed down a bit regretting only that he hadn't bought an apartment in another city, far from his beloved little brother. Days, weeks, months flew by. Robin encountered new girlfriends of his brother's, but he no longer argued, realizing it was pointless. And almost a year ago, Robin lost his passport. He turned the whole house upside down. Nothing. He had to restore the passport. Robin quickly forgot about this incident. Things happen and there was no time to be upset as he was about to go on another long business trip where Robin had to spend almost eight months. But he had to return earlier. He caught a cold which he habitually ignored. The cold turned into pneumonia. Robin ended up in the hospital where he spent three weeks. Fortunately, there were no complications. He wanted to return to work, but his boss ordered him to go home, recover, and regain strength. Robin had to obey, and when he returned, he found other people's things at home. He noticed perfumes and creams, a plush teddy bear on the bed, cute napkins in the kitchen. He even felt pleased. At least Craig brought a housekeeper. The apartment was clearly kept clean. Envying his brother a little, Robin took a shower and went to bed, and woke up next to Selma. And that's the whole story, Robin concluded his tale. So I guess you're my lawful wife, so to speak. By the way, Selma, I like the curtains. Selma looked at him with wide eyes. This can't be, she whispered. My husband, he... He... He's a good person, very kind, smart, and he earns money, pays the mortgage, and also... Yes, yes, I'm kind, smart, and a good person, sighed Robin. But I don't understand why he's getting involved in all this mess. By the way, about your grandfather's apartment, who did he leave it to, sorry? What are you talking about? Selma almost choked with indignation. I'm just trying to understand why he's doing all this, Robin calmly replied. And it would be good to know where he is. Yes, I'm curious too. I think I need to hear his version of what's going on. Selma struggled to contain herself. She wanted to throw something at Robin so he would just disappear into thin air. It was so good until he showed up. He's definitely lying. Now she just needed to figure out what's going on. You see, I asked about this apartment because Craig might have his eyes on it, Robin finally said. 
I think you understand what I mean. Selma, how old is your grandfather? He's over 80, Selma replied. Her mouth inexplicably dried up. No, this can't be. You're deceiving me. Well, okay, Robin shrugged. You can check out my passport. Selma took the document in her hands, the name and surname of her husband. Just the photo was a little different, and the address was the same. The address of her apartment. The apartment she considered her family nest. So, are you convinced? There was genuine sympathy in Robin's voice. Selma, I understand it's not easy, but you've run into my brother. And as you might guess, he's a very interesting person. I'd even say quirky. Please leave, Selma whispered. I'll wait for my husband and talk to him. Selma, I really... Leave, Selma raised her voice. Robin will come and explain everything to me himself. Okay, okay, Robin finished his tea and stood up. I really don't wish you any harm, and I understand that you're a victim in this situation. If you need anything, well... Are you leaving or not? Selma stood up, trying not to look at him from a position of inferiority, and crossed her arms over her chest, trying to appear as threatening as possible. All right, all right, I'm going. Robin shrugged. If anything, give me a call. There are still many issues to resolve, believe me. He waved goodbye and left the kitchen, leaving Selma alone. She sank onto the chair. She was trembling, and she felt a bit nauseous for some reason. The door opened again. Selma saw Robin's face. Do you have somewhere to stay? I can go to a hostel. She grabbed a cup from the table and threw it at him. He managed to close the door in time. Then he peeked out again. Selma, take it easy with the dishes. I mean you no harm. Selma growled. Okay, okay, got it. Robin quickly nodded, disappearing behind the door. The woman feverishly thought about what to do. Of course, this man was lying. It couldn't be otherwise. Her Robin wasn't like that. He was the kindest person. Who's that? Catherine entered the kitchen. Strange guy. He's an acquaintance, Selma muttered to her. I don't understand, Catherine. Honestly. What happened? Why are you breaking dishes? Catherine glanced at the shattered cup. Did he scare you or something? No, no, he... He just said that my apartment isn't mine, Selma whispered. How's that? Catherine raised her eyebrows. Whose is it? His? Yeah, his. Selma started examining her palms folded on her knees. But, but that's just nonsense. Oh my, Selma, go to bed, Catherine sighed. You'll stay here tonight and go to Hector's tomorrow, okay? Yes, yes, you're right. I'll stay here tonight. Selma rubbed her forehead. Her head felt heavy. She was probably about to get a headache. I'll think about everything later. Robin still isn't picking up. Well, he's probably busy. Catherine reached for the teapot. Want some chamomile tea? And you should lie down. I'll wake you up. Do you want me to stay over? Catherine, thanks, but go home. Selma forced a smile. Her head was pounding harder. I'll go to the room, I guess. In her room, Selma collapsed onto the bed without undressing, lying still until Catherine brought her a cup of chamomile tea. Before drifting off to sleep, Selma dialed Robin's number several times, but her husband didn't answer. She woke up to a strange noise, initially thinking a wall in the house had collapsed. Sitting up in bed, Selma immediately grabbed her head, feeling like it was splitting open. Selma! Her head was spinning, and the smell, a strange smell, sharp, acrid, pungent. Selma! Someone was calling her, some man. Maybe Robin. She got up and, swaying, went to the door. The smell intensified. She peeked into the corridor and saw Robin. You're here, she exclaimed. God, I have to tell you something. Let's get out of here. Robin rushed to her, grabbed her, and dragged her towards the exit. I knew it. I knew I'd seen her somewhere. What? What are you doing? Selma murmured, losing consciousness. Who did you see? Selma came to her senses already on the street. She was lying on a bench. People were bustling around. Robin was nearby. Or not Robin. How are you feeling? He leaned over her with a concerned expression. Okay, she grimaced. Selma's lungs felt like they were on fire, 
it was a terrible headache. Finally, she recognized this person. It wasn't her Robin. It was another Robin, the one she woke up next to recently. All right, let's go to my place, he offered her his hand. You'll rest, and then you can tell the police everything. What police? Selma whimpered. What are you talking about? I want to go home. Let's go home then, he helped her up. Catherine is already giving her statement. We just need to find my brother. Didn't think he'd go this far. Wish he some compassion. But what happened? Selma insisted. Let's go, I said. Robin rolled his eyes. Or do you want me to carry you? Selma got to her feet. She couldn't bear to be carried. They walked to Robin's car. Selma didn't understand what she was doing, just obediently following this man. Where did this boundless trust in this barely familiar person come from? Perhaps it was because of his resemblance to her husband. By the way, where was he? Why wasn't her Robin calling her back? They arrived home, to her home, or his. Selma couldn't make sense of it anymore. All she wanted was to lie down and sleep for a couple of days without waking up, and then go to work the day after tomorrow. The man sat her down on the couch in the living room and sat across from her. How are you feeling? Want some water? Yes, please, said Selma. Wait a moment. He left and returned a couple of minutes later with a bottle of water. Here you go. And he really messed things up. So what happened? Selma took a sip of water. Her mind was slowly clearing up, but it only made things worse. The situation seemed even stranger. She's at home or not at home, and who is this person? Did he lie, after all? Well, Selma, Catherine decided to end your life, Robin sighed. Good thing I recognized her. She's changed, of course, dyed her hair, not much makeup. But it's her, no doubt. It turned out that after talking to Selma, Robin went home, fully intending to drag his brother out from wherever he was hiding, and preferably knock some sense into him. Something was bothering Robin, and he couldn't quite put his finger on it. He kept replaying the conversation in his head over and over. Or was it something else? There was something about this academic's house. And suddenly the face of the housekeeper, Catherine, popped into his mind. Yes, that's it. And then it dawned on Robin. He had seen her in his own apartment. She was one of the ladies his brother brought here while Robin was away. Back then, Catherine had blonde hair. Now it was black and she wore heavy makeup the pieces of the puzzle fell into place. Robin realized he couldn't leave poor Selma in that house. What if Craig and Catherine were in cahoots? This version even explained Hector's sudden illness. What if? The academic ends up in the hospital, likely dies there. Next, his granddaughter and heir dies. The house is old. Something happens with the gas pipe. And who benefits? Craig, of course. By the time they figure it out, he'll be somewhere abroad with his Catherine. Robin went to Hector's house. Upon arrival, he smelled gas, called emergency services, broke down the door, and pulled Selma out into the fresh air. Then he took her to his place. Selma shook her head. This can't be. We'll see what Catherine and Craig have to say. I'm incredibly curious. Now go to sleep, Robin sighed. You'll have to give your statement tomorrow, I think. I won't say anything, Selma yawned. You'll have to, he threatened. I'll bring a blanket and my t-shirt. Selma didn't wait for the blanket and t-shirt. She fell asleep as soon as Robin left the living room. In the morning, she found that the man had thoughtfully covered her with a fluffy blanket. The first thing Selma did was call the hospital to check on her grandfather, Hector. She was reassured that he was improving and his condition had stabilized. Selma felt slightly relieved. But what to do next? She had no idea. Craig never called. He didn't respond to her messages either. He was absent from social media too. Selma understood. Mentally, she now referred to her husband as Craig. Although, could she even consider this person her husband? Probably not. Good morning. Robin walked into the room. Selma, we need to talk. After all, you are my wife. Don't joke like that. Selma pulled her knees up to her chin and hugged them. Maybe we should look for Craig. Tears rolled down her cheeks. Her husband, not her husband. Her apartment, not her apartment. Perhaps she was no longer herself at all. But someone else? 
Robin sat down next to Selma and hugged her shoulders. Why are you crying? We're all alive. Selma recoiled and looked at him in surprise. Her tears instantly dried up. What do you think you're doing? Oh, I'm sorry, Robin stammered. I just can't stand women's tears. I found out about your apartment. Well, your grandfather's apartment. It's safe for you to go back. But if it were me, I wouldn't. Why not? Well, I told you about my brother. His girlfriend inexplicably tried to kill you. What if Craig suddenly shows up and tries to finish what this Catherine started? Yeah, I think he might. Selma nodded grimly. But why? Why? Inheritance. And you know too much. I never understood what was going on in his head. I was just sure he wasn't capable of such things, but it turns out... Do you think he did the same to his first wife? Selma asked thoughtfully. I'm afraid to even think about it. Robin sighed sadly. She was certainly odd, but she didn't deserve that for sure. I'll go to my grandfather's, Selma decided. Can I gather my things? Stay here, the man suddenly suggested. Selma, how will you manage alone there? I'll manage somehow, Selma shrugged. If anything, I'll call the police. Does Craig have keys to that apartment? Although he could have made a copy. Robin looked at Selma anxiously. I'm telling you, stay. I'll worry. Why? She protested. You've only known me for two days. Well, I'm like that. Robin winked. Okay, I can't force you. But please, stay in touch. Text me every half hour. What? Okay, every hour. He gently touched her shoulder. Selma, this isn't a joke. Listen, we've been together for quite a while. I think he still loves me, at least a little. Selma felt like crying again, but she managed to hold back the tears. Oh, do as you wish. Robin stood up and looked sternly at Selma. Just don't disappear, please. Selma had breakfast, packed her things, and called a taxi. Robin wanted to see her off, but she declined. For some reason, she wanted to be alone as quickly as possible. She needed to sort out her thoughts figure out what to do next. She felt like she had spent her whole life in a calm and steady story, and suddenly she found herself in a detective novel, and Selma didn't like it at all. Arriving at her grandfather's house, Selma decided to clean up. Cleaning always calmed her down, helped her gather her thoughts, relax. She dusted, mopped the floors, wiped off all the spots from the kitchen cabinets. In the living room on the coffee table, she found a phone. It didn't belong to her grandfather. At first, Selma thought someone from the gas service had forgotten it, but she quickly dismissed that thought. The phone had a cute pink case adorned with Rhenistonese. Selma sat in the armchair, drop it a dust cloth over her shoulder, and press it the button. The phony demanded a password. Selma pondered. If this was Catherine's phone, what password could she choose? First, she entered her date of birth. She knew it for sure, as Catherine had celebrated her birthday recently. The password didn't work. If Catherine and Craig were seeing each other secretly, maybe she chose a password related to her lover's name. But the password didn't work again. Finally, she entered the simplest sequence, 12345, and the phone accepted the password. Selma saw the screensaver, a joint photo of Catherine and Craig. She kissed him on the cheek, and he smiled contentedly. Selma frowned. Good Lord, they both were convinced that there was no one smarter than them in the world. Catherine had been carrying this phone right under Selma and Hector's noses. However, it must be admitted that no one noticed anything, so it couldn't be ruled out that Catherine and Craig were indeed ingenious criminals. Selma pressed the social media button. The conversation with Craig came up immediately. However, he was registered under the name Robin. Unfortunately, Selma didn't learn anything new. The lovers talked about their feelings, what they planned to do in bed, some future trips together. It turned out that Catherine dreams of visiting Singapore. Selma grimaced. Singapore? Ha! What a refined country lady! Suddenly, a green light lit up under Craig's avatar. He was online. Selma bit her lip and froze. He was messaging her. Or rather, Catherine. How are you, dear? Selma took a deep breath. Everything's fine, she typed back. It seems he doesn't know anything. Selma decided to continue the conversation. Good, glad you sorted things out. 
he typed. Craig sent a few emojis, sorted things out. So Selma is the problem? Well, why not? She's the one standing between Craig and unearthly riches, or rather, Hector's inheritance. When can I expect you? Selma wrote. Not sure yet, Craig replied. I think I'll wait a bit longer. I'm afraid of the police. We need to meet, Selma typed. Her hands were sweaty and shaking, and she could barely hold the phone. The letters seemed to blur before her eyes. We need to meet as soon as possible. Darling, how can I? Aren't you scared? He wrote. I am. But something happened. We need to talk in person. Come over. Selma decided to take the risk. It's very important. He was typing a reply. Okay, I'll think about how to do it best. Wait. And delete the conversation. Selma bid farewell to Craig on behalf of Catherine, took screenshots of their conversations, and sent them to her email. Just in case. So, the police didn't notice the phone? Selma wondered. What to do next? Report to the police. No. First, she needed to consult with Robin. Selma dialed his number and told him about her discovery. Selma, why? He sighed. Although... Although I think you're right about something. By the way, I have a friend in the police. He said Catherine isn't saying anything. Forgot to turn off the gas and that's it. Nothing criminal. She doesn't know any Craig, that's all. If they don't find anything to charge her with, they'll let her go, Selma sighed. Or at most, they'll fine her. Let's do this. Let's see what Craig says to you. We'll decide based on the circumstances. Maybe I'll meet him, talk to him. He used to listen to me sometimes, Robin suggested. I'll bring a recorder with me. Ah, this is all so hard. Because he's your brother? Selma asked sympathetically. Yeah, the man answered heavily. Yeah, it's just gone too far. They got married me without me. I think that's not the main problem, Selma decided to argue. Yeah, really, and I even like you. I wouldn't mind having a wife like you myself, Robin laughed. Selma's cheeks turned pink. Oh, I'm just kidding, he said. Anyway, Selma, I'll wait for your message. Or maybe I should come over. Selma pondered. She was already feeling uneasy. Come over, she agreed. I'll be waiting. Half an hour later, he was already there. Craig still hadn't replied. Selma poured Robin some tea and took out cookies from the cupboard. They silently drank tea and waited. She didn't know what to talk to this man about. By the way, did he mention his parents? Robin finally asked. Yeah, Selma nodded. Said they died. Goodness, the man exclaimed. Selma, I'm sorry for him. It's like a shame he's going to end up in prison, at least for falsifying documents. Why apologize? Selma waved her hand. You didn't do any of this. I was really surprised. His choice is atypical, you know. You're smart, and your appearance... Am I not pretty then? Selma joked. It's just not his type. He likes those flashy ones. With curves, Robin outlined two circles around his chest with his hands. Well, something like that. But you're more to my taste, Selma. Are you planning to steal your brother's wife? The woman chuckled. Maybe. He looked at her seriously. Selma realized that Robin wasn't joking. The man looked away. No, don't worry. Am I an idiot to come on to you in such a situation? How about we at least turn on the TV, Selma suggested. She got up and headed to the door. The man got up too, and unexpectedly, he took her hand and pulled her towards him. Listen, what if I'm the idiot? He kissed her. She didn't even resist out of surprise. Finally, Selma realized that something was wrong, albeit quite pleasant. She pushed Robin away with her palms and stepped back. Are you out of your mind? No, he confessed. Should I go? Stay, she said. But let's skip this. I understand that you haven't seen women on your expedition for a long time, but... I've seen everything, Robin objected. But you're right, I rushed. We should wait at least a month. Oh, forget it, Selma waved her hand. Let's go wait. He'll reply sooner or later. I'm sure of it. Craig messaged half an hour later. During that time, they watched some silly talk show whose heroes couldn't figure out who the father of the main character's child was. Selma even got a little distracted, although she tried to avoid such programs. 
a message suddenly appeared on Catherine's phone screen. I'll be at my mother's tomorrow, Craig wrote. Come. I'll come, Selma replied. Thank you. Oh, there it is. Well, Robin announced. Then I'll go to my mother today. Wait, what if she warns him? Selma panicked. And then what? <laughs> I'll wait at a safe distance, the man waved his hand. He won't kill me. I'll intercept and talk to him. I'll go too, the woman said. Why do you need to go? Robin asked. I want to look into his eyes, Selma replied fiercely. I'll ask for time off duty and go. And what do you plan to see there? Robin asked skeptically. Remorse, the pain of loss. Go to your duty. No, I, I'll go. Give me the address. I can go alone. Woman, are you... What are you doing? Robin sighed. All right, just don't interfere, please. I'll interfere, Selma promised, and now I need to go see my grandfather. Well, let's go together, Robin reached out and smiled at the woman. Consider me your personal bodyguard. At the hospital, Selma was assured that Hector would be transferred to a room tomorrow, and then she could see him. They even showed her the test results. After making sure everything was fine, Selma asked to tell her grandfather that she was waiting for him and missed him. Returning home and after reluctantly getting rid of Robin, Selma went to bed. He promised to pick her up at 7 in the morning. Fortunately, Selma was granted time off from work, and she said she was sick, and they believed her. It was a bit awkward, but Selma had no choice. She simply couldn't concentrate knowing that such important events were happening without her. At 7 in the morning, Robin didn't show up. He didn't answer the phone, only sent a message. Stay home. I'll come and tell you everything. Selma growled and almost threw her phone on the floor. He promised. What a scoundrel. However, a decision was quickly made. She grabbed Catherine's phone. She found Craig's mother's address in their correspondence. True, it took her almost an hour. Selma quickly got ready and called a taxi. Yes, she would just come, ring the doorbell, and demand explanations from everyone. And why wait? And maybe nobody even tried to kill her. Maybe it was just a gas pipe malfunction, and Robin came up with something strange. Why should she listen to him at all? After all, he's nobody to her. Although, although, if you think about it officially, he is her husband. But still, it's not a reason to follow him. Driven by pride and curiosity, Selma set off on an adventure. Selma asked the taxi driver to stop a block away from the desired house. She didn't know where Robin had parked his car, and she didn't want him to notice her. Rushing into a store and buying sunglasses and a cap, Selma decided that this disguise would be enough to go unnoticed. She walked to Craig's mother's house, looking around and feeling like a spy. Finally, she found the right house, and even the entrance. Robin's car was nowhere to be seen. Selma settled on a bench and began to wait. She just hoped she wouldn't be noticed. To avoid attracting the attention of vigilant neighbors, Selma occasionally walked around the house. She felt that a stranger sitting on a bench might seem too suspicious. She had to wait for about an hour. The woman already regretted her decision. She should have stayed home or gone to work. Only elderly women with bags, school children, and mothers with strollers were walking around the yard. And suddenly a man came out of the right entrance. Selma froze. It was Craig. She recognized him immediately by his gait. He always moved swiftly, as if in a hurry. Selma's breath caught in her throat. Craig was walking fast, almost running. She decided to act. She wanted to know the truth. The woman jumped up and walked towards him. He didn't notice her right away, and it seemed didn't recognize her. Selma caught up with her husband. Hi, he froze, looking at her with a puzzled expression. Who are you? Didn't recognize me? Oh, come on, she took off her cap. How about now? Oh, it's you. His eyes widened and his eyebrows shot up. You, you, what are you doing here? Me? Oh, I just missed my husband, Selma told him. You know, separation strengthens feelings, and you didn't call or write. Selma, it's not what you think. He lied. Craig lowered his head. I don't know what to do now. I'll tell you. First, tell me your name, the real one. We need to talk, he took her hand. Do you believe that jerk? He envied me all his life, decided to ruin mine. He even envied that I married you. Everyone turned him down. 
Selma looked at him in surprise. Then I'll gladly listen to your version. Go ahead. As you wish. He gently squeezed her hand. Let's go home. I took the keys from him. I don't know what he told you, but this is our apartment. Let's go. Selma realized she desperately wanted to believe him. This was her Robin, the man she dreamed of having children with. The man she fell asleep cuddled up to. Let's go, she nodded. He smiled. I'm glad you believe me. My car is over there, in the parking lot. They reached the car. He sat in the driver's seat and Selma settled in next to him. Craig, or Robin, kept grumbling. My brother, of course, loved to ruin my life. You know, I was loved more since childhood. That's how it turned out. It's not my fault. I studied, listened to my parents. And him? He was fooling around in the yard, even had run-ins with the police. <laughs> the man unzipped his jacket and leaned back in his seat. God, I don't understand when he'll get tired of all this. Selma looked at her husband, and suddenly she noticed a stain on his white t-shirt. A small red stain, as if he had dripped strawberry jam on himself. But Selma had worked as a doctor for many years, and she knew perfectly well what it could mean. Without understanding what she was doing, she opened the door and jumped out of the car and ran, as fast as she could. She had never been into sports, but adrenaline did its job. Stop, he yelled after her. But Selma didn't even think of stopping. She dashed into the entrance. It seemed to her that Craig was already behind her. Fortunately, his mother's apartment was on the second floor. Selma ran up to the door and began knocking on it. She herself didn't understand what she was hoping for. Craig flew after her, he pushed her away from the door, and she flew into the wall, hitting her back painfully. Help! Selma shouted. Shut up! He kicked her in the side. I told you to shut up! Selma tried to get up, but he hit her again. She groaned in pain. What's going on? A female voice came from somewhere above. What's with all the screaming? I'll call the police right now. Help! Selma croaked. Craig stepped back. She looked up and saw his frightened face. Leave the girl alone. This time it was a man speaking. Craig rushed down the stairs. Selma realized. She was saved. The man and the woman who were coming down together with a German shepherd. The man, dressed in a tracksuit, ran after Craig. The elderly woman approached Selma and squatted down next to her. How are you? Should I call an ambulance? Yes, and the police too. Selma muttered before losing consciousness. And please, check that apartment there. They, they killed someone. Selma came to, in the ambulance. What's there? What's in apartment 15? She asked the paramedic sitting next to her and filling out the chart. Oh dear, you better not know, it'll only worry you. The paramedic shook his head. Please tell me, Selma pleaded. Everyone's alive. The man is in critical condition, but alive. The paramedic lowered his voice. And who is he to you anyway? My husband, the woman whispered softly. She met Robin only a week later, visiting him in the hospital. The doctors allowed it. He was lying on the bed, reading some detective novel. Hey, Selma sat on the chair next to him. How are you? Better than ever, he lifted his shirt and showed the bandage on his chest. It'll heal, and you? I'm okay, she shrugged. Got away with a scare and a couple of bruises. What happened? They didn't tell me anything. Yeah, nothing special, replied Robin. I went to my mother's, she made tea. I drank it and blacked out. Probably that's when Craig tried to kill me. Robin sighed. So he, I mean, he conspired with your mom? Selma asked. Well, it seems so. You know, she never argued with him. I don't know what he told her and how he justified the need to kill her second son. By the way, she's in a psychiatric hospital, Selma said. They'll probably declare her insane. She says you were supposed to be brought as a sacrifice. Wow, that's something. Robin put the book on the blanket and ran his hand over his face forcefully. And I was sure they wouldn't go that far. I feel sorry for Mom. How did they figure it out? Craig said they had some passwords with Catherine when they arranged to meet. Special words. I should have read the correspondence carefully. I was scolded for doing all this myself. I scolded you too, but you didn't listen. Robin smiled faintly. Well, am I an authority figure for you? 
and Craig, well done, he still figured it out. He tracked us down, Selma chuckled, figured it all out, probably panicked and decided to get rid of everyone. Well, now he's off, you know where, far and for a long time. By the way, he didn't even have a job. He was spending the money I got from selling my one-bedroom apartment. Now we have to settle all these legal matters. Well, that we're not husband and wife. Robin suddenly looked out the window. I hope it won't take too long. It didn't take long to declare Selma and Robin's marriage invalid, but it took more time to start preparing for a new wedding. The real Robin proposed to Selma just a month after he was discharged from the hospital. And she said yes. Hector approved of his granddaughter's new husband and Selma was convinced that she had made a truly right choice. Because apparently, her grandfather was excellent at understanding people.